local government committee of uh, Kansas House this February the 15th, Wednesday. And uh, thank you for your attendance today. We will open with, uh, the. we have any minutes to approve? No, okay. We will move on to our first item on the agenda and that is the hearing on HB 2376. And for uh, an introduction, we'll ask uh, Jason Long, our our revisor to give us an update and a description. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, uh, House Bill 2376 um, relates to housing discrimination. Um, it does amend uh, provisions under the Kansas Act against discrimination. Uh, that act does prohibit um, unlawful discrimination uh, with respect to real estate transactions. That includes rental property. Um, so you cannot discriminate in those transactions against a person on the basis of their race, religion, color, sex, disability, national origin, or ancestry. Um, the bill... Uh, would make it unlawful to record any restrictive covenant that discriminates on such basis. Um, that is generally already prohibited because of the general prohibitions on um, discriminatory acts and real estate transactions. <clears throat> um, but there is no explicit prohibition under current state law. And so House Bill 2376 would bring in that specific prohibition. Um, just by way of background, a restricted covenant is an agreement that runs with the land. So it's agreement that um, the next person who is acquiring that property cannot use it in a particular way. Uh, for example, if there's like an easement on the property for the city to access for utility purposes, there was, uh, there's oftentimes like a restriction and the property owner couldn't like develop into that easement that would somehow prohibit the city from being able to come onto the property um, and exercise their easement. That would be a type of restrictive covenant on the property. And historically, uh, there were restrictive covenants that restricted um, the property being uh, 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 sold uh, to uh, certain individuals on the basis of uh, those protected classes. And so those are um, unlawful restrictive covenants under House Bill 2376 and are to be given no force or effect under the bill um, if they're discriminatory in that manner. Um, the bill also provides the owner with a method for removing any restrictive covenants that are um, part of a deed that's with recorded with the Register of Deeds Office. Um, they can do so by filing a certificate of release of prohibited covenants. Um, the bill spells out just the details that are to be required, including the property description, the owner's name and address, and a, a brief description of the covenant to be removed so the Register of Deeds can identify that covenant and strike it from uh, the Register of Deeds um, documents. Uh, the bill then also amends uh, 44-1017A. This is a, a current statute that uh, pertains to um, restrictive covenants um, that are part of homeowners association um, declarations or plats that have been recorded with the Register of Deeds. Um, it directs those homeowners associations uh, to remove those unlawful restrictive covenants that were recorded with the HOA uh, recording documents. Uh, what the bill would do would add another provision that in the event there is no active HOA, so the city or county or the Human Rights Commission send out notice to the HOA saying you have a restrictive covenant that's still being recorded needs to be removed. But if that notice goes unanswered because the HOA is no longer active, the bill would grant the city or county where that property is located the authority to go in and file its own certificate of release um, to remove that restrictive covenant from the property um, because there's no owner, there's no HOA to do so um, for that property. Uh, finally, I just point out the bill does create a new statute in the uh, Act Against Discrimination, Section 2, uh, that would prohibit any city or county from adopting a local law or regulation um, that imposes or enforces any anti-discrimination provisions that are more restrictive than what is uh, already prescribed under the state law. 
And so the bill both nullifies any existing local laws or regulations that are more restrictive and prohibits the future adoption of such local laws or regulations uh, that would be more restrictive than what is specified under the state act. Uh, the bill will go into effect on July 1st of this year. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Anyone question? Yes. Representative Featherston. Are locally adopted non-discrimination ordinances considered more restrictive by this bill? They would be considered more restrictive if they prohibit conduct that is not prohibited under the state law or if they were to prohibit conduct with respect to a protected class that is not identified under state law. So does this negate existing non-discrimination ordinances? Those that are more restrictive than what is um, required under the Kansas Act Against Discrimination, yes, it would nullify those provisions. And in a follow-up to that, it would not negate the entire uh, document, but only the portions that were more restrictive. Is that correct? Um, it, it, that is in practicality what would occur in terms of the actual effect. I mean, it would probably be litigated and so it would probably come down to whether or not um, how the court parsed out the local law and regulation as to which portions are being nullified by the provisions of 2376. Representative Amex. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think the majority of what you just asked was my question because I know that there's been an quite a bit of work by many, many cities and counties across the state in um, uh, putting together uh, non-discrimination ordinances. But understand, uh, uh, Revisor Long, um, I think a majority of the times that um, a, a local ordinance that had anything other than the language that's specified in the beginning of section two, it's gonna nullify the entire ordinance that's, that's local and it's gonna to have to be totally rewritten. That could be the case if that's the judgment uh, when when the local ordinance resolution is challenged. Anyway, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Could you give me some examples of protected classes by local non-discrimination ordinances that wouldn't be protected by this bill? Um, I have not reviewed any local ordinances or resolutions that have been adopted to date that and, and what their protected classes are. So I, it would be pure speculation on my part and, and I would rather not speculate in front of the committee. I, I can certainly go look at some uh, in the interim and report back to the committee on some protected classes that are identified that are not specified under the state law. Thank you, Mayor Conferees will enlighten us. Okay. Any other questions for the revisor? All right. Not seeing any. Thank you, sir. Next is uh, we have two proponents um, who are going to present in committee. Uh, first one is Representative Patrick Penn from the 85th District. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, and Madam Ranking and committee members. Thank you for having us here today. Uh, I brought this bill, House Bill 2376, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak on it. Happy Black History Month. Happy Black History Month. That's what this bill is about. Not about any other issue. This Black History Month, I rise before you and, and strongest support of House Bill 2376. This bill is simple, it is fair, it is consistent, and it empowers local governments across the state of Kansas to both ensure their alignment with and compliance with U.S. federal and Kansas state law on anti-discrimination and empowers them to finally have the tools that they need to begin more easily rectifying a decades-old issue, namely, racially discriminatory restrictive covenants. In my testimony provided to you, I gave you two examples of the restrictive covenants that we found in Wichita and Cedric County. There's plenty more all over the state. Uh, I ask you to look at those. What I will do is at this time, sir, 
I'll read to you an excerpt of the one. This is with my testimony. Paragraph two of this particular restrictive covenant says, no person of any race other than the white race shall occupy any lot, tract, building site, or building in said addition, except that this shall not apply to or prevent occupancy, occupancy by domestic servants. Now, in the 30s and 40s, when that was written, that was the hired help. Some have interpreted that to mean slaves as well. This is a blight on our records across Kansas. That's what this bill seeks to rectify. It also seeks, as I said before, to pull us into compliance with and alignment with U.S. federal and the state of Kansas law. Thank you to uh, Revisor Long for explaining it. I don't want to belabor the point, but very quickly, in accordance with the 1968 Fair Housing Act, Section 1 prohibits recording discriminatory restrictive covenants and provides that owners can file a certificate of release. Why is this important? The situation that we have, ladies and gentlemen, is that back in the 1930s, 1920s, 1930s, restrictive covenants were placed on deeds for land and property. It was an effect to mitigate what was seen as the migration of black people out of the South because of Jim Crow into the North and to create neighborhoods that would block them out. It's the precursor to what we call redlining. These deeds and these, these things that were, uh, the, the restrictive covenants that were placed on these deeds were also in place with mechanisms that made it almost impossible to jump through the hoops to get them removed easily. So in 1948, a, co a case went before the Supreme Court, the Shelley case, and the U.S. Supreme Court in 1948 said that these restrictive covenants were unconstitutional and unenforceable. Another 20 years passed by before the Congress took action on it in 1968 with the Fair Housing Act. They determined that it was unconstitutional and unenforceable as well. The state of Kansas and many states did not necessarily put something on their books to echo what the federal law said. So this practice has continued, unbeknown to some, as a matter of fact. Move forward to, as Revisor Long was saying, uh, back in 2005, I think there was reporting done on this across Kansas and across Missouri, and they put in a statute that dealt with functional HOAs. The problem that we found was that HOAs that were defunct, you didn't have a belly button to go and push. So how do you make that happen? That's what this bill does as well. Uh, spoke with some of my colleagues. I know that they presented another bill that's been incorporated in this bill. And they've been working with me, not just as of Friday, as recent reporting says, but weeks ago. Contrary to whatever was said in said reporting. That's why it's in here. The next piece is, if we're going to be compliant with the federal law on non-discrimination, in the state of Kansas. I would say that we need to be compliant with non-discrimination law that's federal across the state of Kansas. So in accordance with the 1964 Civil Rights Act, section two prohibits cities and counties from adopting any local law or regulation against discrimination that is more restrictive than our current law, here even in the state of Kansas, the Kansas Act Against Discrimination, which is identical to federal anti-discrimination statutory law. Section three amends that, uh, that standard that we just talked about, KSA 44 TAC 1017A, to authorize cities and counties to file a certificate of release when an HOA is no longer active to file such corrective uh, documents itself. Now, the standard that we already have on the book says that an entity known as the Human Rights Commission can go in and identify where these restrictive covenants are. They can file the complaint on it, and they can do the expungement of the records. The only thing that we added in here is that is removed, added a step saying that uniformly you will go for purposes of good governance and recording to the Register of Deeds, even the Human Rights Commission. They can still go and identify, can still file the complaint. It's just that the activity of removing through the records and everything actually is governed by the Register of Deeds. That's all. It is still done at zero fee or zero cost. We have left this to the local level because not all of the, uh, the counties are the same. Some are big and some are small. So not all of them wanted to charge a fee. We leave that to them to govern as they see fit. Some of them have paper 
copies of their deeds. So it's a matter of them going in to white it out, I suppose, or black it out to redact. Some of them are, you know, larger counties and they have personnel that uh, can be apportioned to do this task. And they can go in and do it electronically or over fish or whatever the case is. I let the local government decide what's the right size fit on how they want to execute this. This is about the state empowering the local government because that's what they wanted. I got with the Association of the Register of Deeds, all 105 counties. They helped me write this bill. We got with the title companies. They helped give us input to this bill. We got with all of the key stakeholders. I worked to bring all those constituents, key stakeholders, and many others to confirm the prevalence of the issue and ascertain the bill accurately and feasibly addresses it. I did not want to have a solution in search of a problem. It is a problem. This is the solution. I'm confident that the language of this bill is acceptable, meets the need, and aligns with our law, the Kansas Act Against Discrimination. I am attaching two examples of the racially discriminatory re restrictive covenants found in Sedgwick County. Also, in, included in my testimony, you see a few web links that are covering the topic of discriminatory covenants in Kansas and Missouri. They show how this legislation, as written and plainly intended, is urgently needed to help correct the deficiency in our law and protect, going forward, any future acceptance or filing of such racist language and from finding a home here in Kansas. Our fight right now, ladies and gentlemen, is not amongst ourselves. Our fight, Mr. Chairman, is to protect our citizens by providing clarity and ensuring that the Kansas anti-discrimination law is not only uniform, not only compliant, not only congruent with the federal law and its application across the state, but that it also provides the proper mechanisms to be enforced down to the local government level. We can make this a win today for Kansas. Let's do something that does something. I urge you to support me. And uh, if you have the opportunity to work the bill, vote yes on House Bill 2376 and recommend it favorably out to the full body. Thank you, Mr. Chair. At this time, I'll stand for questions. We'll take questions after the next conferee uh, gives his proponent. Thank All you, right? Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> next to the mic, we have uh, Mark Toon, Vice President of Governmental Affairs uh, for the Kansas Association of Realtors. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Mark Toom. I'm the Vice President of Governmental Affairs for the Kansas Association of Realtors, and I'm going to be talking about really the, the un, what I think is the underlying uh, bill and that we've been working on for quite some time. Uh, it was actually first brought up to me in a conversation with uh, former Attorney General Derek Schmidt, um, and that was following the state of Missouri had just involved um, themselves into creating a mechanism to remove these racially uh, restrictive covenants um, and providing a tool for homeowners to do so. Um, and uh, we were wanting to pursue it. Um, and, and we looked into it and I, I was reminded of a time when I used to work for the, the League of Kansas Municipalities and we had actually provided a tool back in the early 2000s involving homeowners associations to do this. Um, but there's clearly still that needs to be more that needs to be done. Um, I've heard from my members uh, about the experiences when you go to, um, you know, when you're going to a closing and, and at a title uh, office and you see all the papers and I assure you that people do read and see all of those papers um, and there is that disclosure of that covenant and there are at times disgusting and disturbing things in that, in those covenants um, and it's, it's still there. Um, and I think that having a mechanism, and that's the, the reason we're here in support um, of that part of it. I think Section 2 is a separate uh, discussion. Um, and I think that there's, there could be some suggested uh, language. And I think that's, that probably warrants its own uh, bill and discussion, quite frankly. Um, but the issue um, of racially descriptive covenants and removing those and providing a tool is something that we've worked with. Um, we were supportive of, of Attorney General Schmidt. Uh, earlier this year, there was a set, uh, a bill, um, House Bill 2174, um, that uh, Representative Hsu um, and also um, Senator Corson did Senate Bill 77. I think the mechanisms actually in this bill to remove covenants is superior um, uh, to those two pieces of legislation. I think th this, the part of this bill that provides uh, a tool for both homeowners, local governments, um, and uh, homeowners associations is an effective way uh, to remove these um, restrictive covenants. And I think it's about time. Um, I will uh, leave it to, um, I will essentially on section two, leave it to others to defend. 
Thank you, sir. Is there any questions for either one of the conferees? Any any other questions from this panel? Representative Featherston. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think this goes to the original sponsor of the bill. Um, I think we can all agree that racial covenants do not reflect our Kansas values, and I hope we do. So if this bill is about not discriminating, would you consider it a friendly amendment to add in protections from discrimination from those related to their sexual orientation and gender identity? Ma'am, if you would if you would address that question at the point of our of our discussion in this in this body uh, when we deliberate over, I'd appreciate it. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for the conferees? Okay. Uh, proponents uh, written only uh, come from Paul Davis, Unified Government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, Wendy Weiss. Legislative Committee Chair for the Kansas Register of Deeds Association, Tanya Buckingham, uh, Sedgwick County Register of Deeds, and uh, Jay Hall, Rep, uh, Deputy Director and General Counsel for the Kansas Association of Counties. Okay, now we have opportunity for opponents to come and, and speak to this bill. I would invite Michael Papa, Mayor of City of Roland Park, to come to the microphone. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Chair Burquist, members of the committee. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, testify uh, before you today. Um, and as uh, Representative Penn said, happy Black History Month. And because hopefully we will not be here in June, I also wanted to uh, wish you a happy Gay Pride Month. Um, on behalf of the Roland Park governing body, I stand here before you today in opposition of HB 2376 as written specifically new section two that has been discussed, which would invalidate existing municipal non-discrimination ordinances and it would prevent any uh, future adoption of ordinances, resolutions, or policies seeking to extend local protections to groups of Kansas that are not currently listed in the Kansas Act Against Discrimination. We heard earlier from the revisor uh, what those uh, classes are uh, on the uh, Kansas Human Rights Commission website. Uh, it lists uh, race, religion, color, sex, disability, ancestry, national origin, retaliation, age in the area of employment only, familial status in the area of housing only, and genetic screening and testing in the area of employment only. So as you can see, not all of the classes, not all of the groups that are listed are protected equally in all areas. And this list also leaves out groups of Kansans that are regularly discriminated against, namely on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. In 2014, I'm proud to say that Roland Park became the first city in Johnson County to enact a non-discrimination ordinance that included the LGBTQ community. It included discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. We also included, which is not in the list I just read, military status. So our ordinance, when we enacted it, also included um, protections against discrimination on military status. All Kansans should be afforded the right to pursue life free from discrimination and deserve equal and equitable legal protections under the law. And since federal and state laws do not offer these protections to uh, members of the LGBTQ community specifically, Kansas municipalities have now taken it into their own hands to adopt inclusive ordinances that protect all members of, community, of their communities. In fact, currently we have about 24 cities in the state of Kansas that protect their uh, community members against discrimination on sexual orientation and gender identity. And that's about 49% of total population of the state in those communities. Roland Park believes that cities and counties should have the authority to remove racially restrictive covenants. That language is disgusting 
and it does not need to be there. And while HB 2376 purports to just do this, it seems that it's on a property by property basis. Whereas uh, HB 2714 that was mentioned earlier, that was introduced in January, that many cities, including Roland Park, support and um, have helped give input to, it does it on a, uh, by plat. So a city or county or the HRC can remove these racially discriminatory um, um, covenants for an entire plat, not just one property. Furthermore, this bill, HB 2376, it pits the rights of select groups against the human rights of other groups. Cities are no longer able to protect any class that is not listed in the uh, Kansas Act for Discrimination. Discrimination of any kind is wrong. It's not a Kansas value and it should not be tolerated. So I stand here before you today and I ask that if you decide to work this bill, please remove section two. It has no place in this bill. It has nothing to do with racial covenants. Or work the other bill, the bill that was introduced in January. Work that bill, remove section two. Remove those racial covenants, but please do not take the rights away from other members of our community. Thank you so much, and I stand for questions when appropriate. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. The other opponent testimony is from Rabbi Mahdi Ryber, and I forgot to spell that right. <laughs> I, give it, if you'd introduce yourself, thank you, sir. I'm Rabbi Moti Reber. I'm the executive director of of Kansas. It's the first time I've been in this, at this committee, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank I'm the you. executive director of Kansas Interfaith Action. Uh, we're a statewide issue advocacy group that partners and represents faith communities throughout the state, uh, primarily mainline Christian, Jewish, and Muslim communities. And I'm standing in opposition to HB 2376, similarly on the basis of the Section 2. So racial covenants um, still exist on many pro residential properties in Kansas. This is a remnant uh, of America's and Kansas's troubled racial past. I, I, want, I, I like to point out that Jews were also restricted in many of these covenants, uh, particularly in Johnson County. I think uh, Representative Shu represents areas that used to have, that used to, that still have anti-Jewish covenants. Um, that's one of the reasons why he took an interest in this issue. Um, I. Definitely, I'm, I've been following his efforts to develop a, a, a bill that would address this issue. Um, because it doesn't have the force of law, because the Fair Housing Act precludes the enforcement of these uh, covenants, uh, it hasn't been the highest priority for us because we try to de deal with um, things that are doing ongoing damage. But we certainly have, uh, uh, have followed approvingly his efforts to address this issue. And if that were all this, this legislation did, I would happily support it. Um, but, but section two really sours the milk quite significantly. This legislature has failed for some time, for, for forever, but for certain, some, certainly some years to pass a non-discrimination ordinance on the state level, despite repeated attempts. In response to, this allows um, discrimination against LGBT Kansans uh, in housing, employment, medical care, and basically any for any reason. It leaves LGBT Kansans unprotected. Um, in the absence of the, in, in, in the, as a consequence of the legislature's failure to address this issue, municipalities throughout the state have addressed it by passing non-discrimination ordinances on the local level. As you've heard, there's 19 of them, I believe. Um, including many of the largest population areas of the state, including Wichita and all the municipalities in Johnson County. And this is the work that this bill, that section two of this bill seeks to undermine. And I want to say clearly that the use of an, of an important anti-discrimination bill for a discriminatory purpose is deeply cynical. It's using an important historical corrective to do actual harm to people who are currently protected by their municipalities. 
As you know, as you probably know, there's been a no quite a number of anti-LGBT bills heard this week in this body. Um, I, I, I never get the kind of engagement from clergy that I get when there's an anti-LGBT bill. I get calls, how can we testify? How can we be involved in this? It's something that really resonates with the members of, of my coalition. Um, they are very determined, Episcopalians, Lutherans, um, even United Methodists as they come along, um, Congregationalists, our Jews, are very determined to defend the rights of L LGBT Kansans. Uh, and they are very steadfast in that regard. Um, the restrictions, members of the committee, Mr. Chairman, the restrictions, the, these restrictions from covenants need to be removed. That, that is an important historical wrong that needs to be corrected. But it does not have to have the poison pill of damaging the harder and legal protections of LGBT Kansans throughout the state. I would be happy to support this bill uh, if Section 2 were removed from it. But as it stands now, I stand in opposition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a quick question about this other bill that keeps being referred to. Do we have a bill number for that? Which one is that? I'm going to repeat all that. Uh, I just was notified that I was going in without a microphone. <clears throat> Again, thank you for your testimony, uh, the two opponents. And uh, we'll move on to identifying the opponents written only. Uh, Jan Fadley, Council Member, City of Roland Park. Taryn Jones, Equality Kansas. Solana Flora, Mayor of Mission, Kansas. Stacey Knoll, Executive Director, American uh, African American Affairs Commission. Amanda Mogoy, uh, APRN and owner of MCare Healthcare. Aileen Berquist, uh, Policy Director, American Civil Liberties Union uh, of Kansas. Liz Haymor, CEO of Center of Daring. Uh, Michael Koss. Deputy City Attorney for City of Overland Park. Connie Brown Collins, Founder and Director, Voter Rights Network of Wyandotte County. And Brandon Johnson, Wichita City Council. Thank you for uh, your patience as I reread those for the sake of those that are online. All right, and uh, we have one neutral testimony, uh, Spencer Duncan, uh, Governmental Affairs, Director, of Legal Municipalities. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Chair and Committee. Glad to be back. Um, this is one of those hearings that's a little deflating, and I'll tell you why. Because this should be a unifying bill. We should be standing here today really without argument over its primary goal. There is really, I'm sure somebody out there, but no disagreement that it is time to change this law that this restrictive covenants have got to be changed for all the horribleness that they have created throughout the state of Kansas. Um, that's bipartisan, and it's just the right thing to do. But then we come to what I think is the, the round peg we're trying to put into the square hole, and that is Section 2. And that's why I am here neutral today, because we appreciate and want every other section of this bill. And the truth is section two can be removed without impacting any of the rest of this legislation. And it would move through without any of the conversation you've hear, heard here today, and it would become law. I'm not here to tell you who should be the protected class or what section two should or shouldn't do. You know my line. For us, section two is article 12, section five of the Kansas constitution which has been tested many times and a few times on this issue, and that's that 
cities and counties have the authority to set their non-discrimination clauses. I'll also tell you that while I know the focus has been on things like the LBGTQ community, um, a lot of the cities have passed protections for military personnel, which are not part of the state code, and those would be rolled back. So I throw those out there as part of our concerns with that in general, but I don't want to be talking to you today about Section 2. If we want to have that discussion, then it should be, as was alluded to earlier, its own bill, and we should stand up here and have a discussion about what that means and, and give it its own merit. Because I do think that while there may be a discussion there to be had that this legislature wants to have, I'm just deflated that it's part of what otherwise is a bill that I think we all agree need. And my last point will be if you go through, I've read through all the proponent and opponent neutral testimony, and you will see a thread among all of them, the, even the ones in support, a few of them drop in that we still don't like section two. So, so I think my suggestion would be we, the league can support this without section two for those reasons I've given. Otherwise, we're, we're neutral on it because we really do like the rest of it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for standing for questions. Is there any questions for Mr. Duncan? They're not seeing any. Uh, we will close this hearing on HB 2376. Appreciate your attendance. There was, uh, before that closing, I'm going to make note of a neutral testimony uh, written only by Phoebe Nesseth, uh, Director of Community Association of Public Affairs. And a disclaimer for everybody's name that I read off earlier that was mispronounced, send me a note. I'll, I'll fix it. Thanks. Thank you for your attendance. And this, this hearing is closed. We'll move on to the next hearing which is uh, for House Bill 22, 23, 20, 23. Repeated myself, 23, 23. Thank you, uh, Reviser Long, for uh, giving us a brief description. Thank you, folks. Wait, door close, that's good. Yes, you're on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. House Bill 2323 uh, amends one statute, 19-3623F. Um, this statute governs the transfer of property of certain fire districts after the land has been annexed by a city. Um, uh, specifically, the statute, the statute is part of an act that governs fire districts that are uh, established in Johnson County. Um, and under current state law, if land um, in Johnson County Fire District is annexed by a city, uh, then the annexing city and that fire district are directed to negotiate the transfer of that property to the city. And those negotiated agreements are then uh, submitted to the Board of County Commissioners for approval. Um, so House Bill 2323 essentially puts a deadline on those negotiations between the city and the fire district. Um, it, it would direct that um, the property would continue uh, to be part of the fire district until either an agreement on that transfer of property is reached between the city and the fire district or one year from the date of the annexation, whichever occurs first. Um, and so if there is an agreement that's reached within that one year, it would go to the Board of County Commissioners for approval. If an agreement is not reached between the city and the fire district on that anniversary date, uh, then the property would simply by law become detached from the fire district and would be transferred to the annexing city. Uh, the bill will go into effect on July 1st of this year, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for the advisor? All right. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. And we will move on to uh, proponent testimony. First, from I'm going to take a good guess at this DeGraff and Reed, uh, Jeff DeGraff and Reed of the Fire Chief of City Olathe. Is that pretty close? All right. Thanks. Uh, Chairman, uh, members of the committee, Jeff DeGraff, Reed, Fire Chief for the City of Olathe, Kansas. Thanks for letting me be in front of you. You have my written testimony, so my comments will be brief. 
Um, in Johnson County, uh, we have great cooperation and some of my uh, partner agency uh, fire chiefs are here. Uh, and we really do try our very best to provide great services. And as the advisor mentioned, this bill is uh, aimed at Johnson County only. Uh, when the city annexes land, uh, we have a strong desire to provide fire services uh, early on uh, as soon as we can in those uh, situations. Um, and we have strong conversations um, when we're talking about development. So uh, in particular, the city I represent, uh, over 500 residential homes are being built a year and uh, millions of square foot uh, buildings are being built on any given year. And these are important conversations so people know uh, about their fire protection that they will have uh, when the annexation and detachment happens. Uh, this does not change any of the negotiation that continues to happen as it does today. What it does uh, is puts a timeline on it for one year. Uh, and then if that um, hasn't happened in one year, um, then it becomes automatic. Um, and I think that continues to encourage fire districts uh, in the communities uh, like the one I represent to have those conversations. I can tell you uh, that this is not a fix to a uh, emerging or problem issue today. We continue to work very hard um, to make sure that local governments and fire districts come to uh, a good conversation, but sometimes it takes a long time. Uh, there are a lot of important things uh, that happen in any given local government, uh, and this pushes this forward and makes sure those conversations happy, happen in a timely fashion. Uh, those are my comments. Be happy to stand for any questions you might have. Take the other uh, proponent uh, testimony first, and we'll see if there's any questions. Uh, next is Jim Francis, Fire Services Administrator for Johnson County, and and he and he has declared that he's written only, so your his testimony is available uh, as well. So uh, we have. Um, are there any more uh, proponents in attendance that want to speak? Not seeing any. Uh, is there anyone in opposition that would like to speak? Uh, yes. If, since there are no other uh, proponents, we would uh, entertain questions from the committee. Is there any questions? All right. Representative Vestix, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So glad to have you. Uh, Chief DeGraff and Reed, you did a great job on his name. Um, just wanted to uh, bring to light when these um, deadlines don't exist and the longer it takes for um, the annexation, the detachment, right, to happen, what's happening to taxpayers in the meantime? Representative Essex, that's a good question. Um, so uh, if a detachment, until a detachment occurs, uh, the, the property owner will continue to pay taxes to the fire district. Um, our community has chosen not to um, uh, apply our fire portion of the mill levy to those residents, but there's no law that requires that we could do that. Um, so um, no matter who's servicing in Johnson County, we have a strong automatic aid agreement. Um, we just feel that it's in the best interest of the community um, that the closest appropriate fire apparatus respond to whatever emergency it is. And matter of fact, that is a, a something that's recognized nationwide, the cooperation of our fire agencies. Uh, but at the end of the day, the taxing money would go to the fire district until detachment happens. Representative Blex. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your testimony. I'm assuming when you're talking about those fire districts, uh, is there fire, rural fire uh, situations in those districts that, or not? Uh, certainly when those districts were uh, created in the beginning, they were serving the rural portions of the county. Uh, There's much growth um, in their own districts uh, and uh, the communities they serve. Um, the, the conversation we're having today is um, on those areas that are really uh, annexing right up to our city border and our growth areas. Uh, and this this would provide an opportunity during, you know, development conversations with business and, um, you know, developers for uh, residential communities to to be able to know who uh, their fire protection will be and what the expectations are uh, during the development process. Okay. Uh, in those areas where that rural fire district may have a, a building that they're operating out of, do you see that as being any, how do you handle those? Do you, I mean, they're uh, going to have to give up their building uh, turned over to you, I guess. 
Uh, I appreciate the good question, and I appreciate uh, you thinking forward like that. Um, that not, has not happened in our experience, but it certainly could uh, happen. Um, and I think, you know, this bill does continue to protect um, any of the geo bonding that a district would have needed to do for stations and equipment uh, so that they can continue uh, n and to not be in a financial crisis. Um, so they the, that money would stay with the folks who were taxed initially in that geo bond. Um, and if, you know, if there is a building or piece of equipment that needs to be transferred and both fire district and the municipal government recognize that, then that should be part of the negotiations. And, and, and it has happened in Johnson County, not uh, with the city of Olathe, but others um, in certain situations with contracts. And uh, it's been mature governance to work through that. Thank you for that. Okay. Is there anyone else? Yes, Representative Featherston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just looking online and it appears that Mr. Francis's written testimony is actually opponent testimony. That's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that correction. Uh, you can duly note that uh, with, uh, with the testimony as you consider for our disposition of this bill. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. And any, anyone else for questions for either uh, for the this gentleman. Okay. I will close the hearing on 2323. And thank you all for your attendance for that. We have final action uh, consideration on three bills. Uh, and that is, um, first will be HB 2083. And for just a brief reminder, if uh, um, Reviser Long would uh, give a, a brief reminder of this bill. <clears throat> if you would, sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, House Bill 2083 is the bill that would create the Kansas Vacant Property Act. Um, this act would define vacant property and prohibit any municipality from adopting any local uh, law or regulation uh, that would require the owner, operator, manager, lien holder, or mortgagee of that property to register with the municipality, pay any tax fee or other charge on the property on the basis that it is vacant, um, or pay any tax fee or other charge um, against a legal mortgagee or equitable mortgagee or lien holder to enforce a mortgage um, by judicial means. Um, any such local law uh, or regulation uh, would be declared null and void if it was already um, had been adopted prior to July 1st of this year. Um, it does not uh, prohibit any other local regulation uh, being adopted or enforced um, that is applicable to all real property located in the municipality. All right. I, I brought that to say that I'm going to reverse a little bit of order for how we consider this. Um, after the hearing that we, we all were part of, uh, the, the major opponents and proponents in this matter uh, have met together and have have been able to devise some uh, compromise language, and that would be in the form of some amendments. So I want to I want us to open consideration of HB 2083 with uh, the submission of these amendments one by one, if that's all right. Okay. The the first of these amendments uh, is. Um, on line 20 through 22, uh, it says, to, you know, remember these are uh, restrictions uh, that would be removed. This restriction would not be removed. On striking line 20 to 23, it would strike, register, or otherwise submit such property to such municipality for inclusion in a record of vacant properties maintained by such municipality or any agent thereof. So the striking of that would, would remove, remove the uh, restriction uh, against that. So the, the, the discussion came about that uh, this would not be forbidden, but that the portion that still says uh, some sort of a fee, uh, it, uh, yes, Revisor, if you'd go ahead and describe that uh, number two. 
Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, the balloon would strike the prohibition against uh, maintaining a registry of vacant property by municipality. So uh, the owner, operator, or lien holder, mortgagee uh, may still be required under the amendment to register the property, but they would not be required to pay any tax fee or other charge on the property on the basis that it's vacant or to enforce any mortgage or lien by judicial means. So the pay the, the tax or fee prohibition would remain under the bill. Any questions on the amendment before we ask for uh, action? Yes, sir. Representative Amex. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This would be for the reviser. Uh, question. How about a fine? Um, a fine would have to be based on some kind of code violation. Um, and it would have to be a code violation strictly on the basis that the property is vacant property um, and would probably fall under other charge um, under that catch-all language under this bill. Um, if the code violation is not on the basis of just the property being vacant, um, then it would be a generally applicable code violation that would not be prohibited under this bill. Yes, sir. Just, just so that you know, and, and the other members of the committee knows, I, I have a real hard time uh, as being a former, you know, uh, city elected official of um, uh, not doing everything that I can to keep local control local. And, and so, you know, I'm just having a hard time with this. But I bring that up because I still think that there's going to be charges in this thing. But uh, Revisor's right. I mean, it's going to be some legal action or some violation of some other ordinance. For this amendment, is there a, is there a motion uh, and a second for discussion? Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. And Representative Barth, is that a second? I just had another quick question before we move. Uh, okay, for a second for discussion, is there a second? Representative Bell. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Representative Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Jason, just for clarification of what you said there. So where it says on 16, shall adopt or enforce any ordinance. Basically, you're, from there, it's saying that they would not be able to tax or add any fees for these vacant properties. Is that what it's saying? Mr. Chairman, um, Members, yes, the, the prohibition there starting on 16, so the municipality could not adopt or enforce any local ordinance resolution or regulation that would require the payment of a tax, a fee, or other charge by the property owner on the basis that the property is vacant um, or any tax fee or charge on a mortgagee or lien holder to enforce um, a mortgage or lien on that vacant property. And any other questions? Just simply on the amendment, uh, um, Representative Blex, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll close on my amendment. All right. All in favor of the amendment, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstain. And that amendment passes. Next amendment. Uh, Jason, would you uh, give a description of the Second Amendment, which would be, uh, yeah, the second page you you will receive. And you're on. Yes, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, um, the second proposed amendment number two um, are amendments to clarify language with respect to mortgagees and lien holders that are affected um, by the legislation. The first amendment you can see in lines 18 and 19 um, clarify that the individuals who would be impacted by the ordinances or resolutions would include legal or equitable mortgagees or lien holders with an interest in the vacant property. Um, this is to clarify the terms lien holder and mortgagee in line 19. 
Um, the second uh, amendment is down uh, in line 27 um, to also restrict municipalities from imposing any responsibility of property ownership, such as repair, maintenance, or security on a legal or equitable mortgagee or lien holder. I believe you, the committee recalls testimony to that effect of those mortgagees and lien holders being held responsible for property that they did not legally have access to. Uh, and then finally, there is lines, uh, language stricken in lines 31 and 32 um, to simply um, remove those uh, provisions with respect to consideration of whether or not uh, property is considered vacant um, by default foreclosure, probate, or bankruptcy. Any questions for the revisor? Not seeing any. Is there a motion concerning this amendment? Representative Black. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move this second amendment on House Bill 2083 forward favorably. Seconded by Representative Underhill. Okay. Any further discussion? Representative Underhill. So if I'm not so if I'm not mistaken, um, the first amendment appeased the landlords association. This amendment appeases the bankers so the bankers, correct? That could be. It could be. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. If there's no further discussion, um, Representative Blex, you can move on your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that we work amendment, but we close on this motion on House Bill 2083. All in favor, please say aye. All opposed? Abstain. And motion passes. And there is one more, one more amendment, and that'll be it, unless somebody else has one. Yeah. If everybody has a copy, uh, Jason, if you'd uh, describe this amendment. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, this third amendment on the nullification provision lines 28 and 29, um, the current language of the bill um, could be read to nullify an entire ordinance resolution or regulation uh, when given the previous um, amendments that are adopted by the committee, uh, it may only be the uh, payment of a tax or fee or other charge that is being nullified under the provisions of the bill and not say a registry requirement. And so uh, this balloon clarifies that it would be that provision of any ordinance resolution or regulation that requires the payment of any tax fee or other charge um, that is prohibited under the provisions of the bill that would be nullified. It's just to clarify only those portions, only those portions of the local law regulation and not the entire law or regulation. Any questions for the revisor? Okay. Not not seeing or hearing any, uh, Representative Blex. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the third time, I move this amendment favorably, and hopefully maybe the neutral Spencer Duncan, this would be for him, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very good. Well, uh, if, and uh, Andrew second. Representative Andrew Hill seconded. And uh, if there's no further discussion, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. Uh, all opposed, abstain, and that amendment passes. Now we're back on the bill. Is there a motion concerning House Bill 2083? Representative Blex. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Finally, we get to this final day here. We're going to move House Bill 2083 favorable for the passage as amended. Thank you. Is there a second to that and, and amended? Yes, Representative Melton. Okay. And moved by Representative Blex, uh, seconded by Representative Melton. And is there discussion? Yes. yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, go back to my original statement. Um, I, I 
believe that the amendments that were brought forward, I think, uh, clean up a number of things. But I still believe that these are items that are for the committee's sake uh, and the public that's listening. Uh, I do believe that these are things that need to be taken up by the locals. I think they do a better job at, at doing these things. But um, uh, so I can't support it. But I appreciate the work that was brought forward by members of the committee and the amendments and, and the revisor's office. So anyway, thanks. thank you, sir. Any other comment? Yes, Representative Featherston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to second what Representative Amex has to say. I do think the amendments have made the bill better, but I still think we're meddling where we don't belong. If there's no further discussion, uh, I'll ask for a vote. All in favor of the bill uh, 2083 being passed as amended, please say aye. All opposed? And that you also? And so the vote was um, whole body minus three. How many are we here today? Uh, so it'd be seven to three. All right. And so we uh, will move that out uh, and that will be on the uh, going to the house floor and we will have a, a carrier for that bill. Next for final action is House Bill 2150, repealing the zoning and planning authority for cities in a three mile area extended from the ba city boundaries. Is there a motion on this bill? Excuse me, if you would go ahead and review that for the sake of the audience and for the sake of the committee. Yes, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, House Bill 2150 was the <clears throat> bill that would um, strike the authority of cities to uh, extend their planning and zoning regulations into an area three miles beyond the uh, boundary of the city. Uh, it would strike that authority and repeal the three statutes um, that provide the procedures for uh, implementing that authority by the cities. Is there a motion regarding the disposition of this bill, Representative Butts? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I recommend that when the committee works this House Bill 2150, they pass it out favorably for passage. Is there a second to that motion? Representative Barth. It's been moved and seconded by Representative Blex and Representative Barth. And a, a comment? from Representative Amick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, uh, to the um, uh, members of the uh, committee, um, again, local decisions need to be local. Uh, that's that's what this is about. Planning for the future by cities and being able to um, uh, work in areas to be able to plan with the extension of utilities and everything else. It's an expensive business and, and, and it's something that um, they need to have that ability to be able to do. So I won't be supporting this bill. Thank you, sir. And uh, is there any other comments? Representative Blunt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I understand fully that uh, cities need planning and, and issues and, and probably need to work a little bit better with their rural counterparts. I still have the problem with in my case, and where the city of Independence had an airport 10 miles out and imposed a three mile zoning and then put a lot of restrictions on it. It took about four years and, and not, it wasn't in the form of taxes, but building permits. They had a neighbor had to pay a $600 building permit for a barn that he was getting ready to build, a farm barn uh, or storage barn. So, uh, I guess I support this, and, and I don't know that there's a real good compromise, but I, yet I understand Representative Amix's comment about, you know, the issues of planning for growth. I understand that local control, but that's kind of my two cents. I have, I certainly uh, have had a number of years of experience in, in municipal planning and growth, and, and I I understand the argument Representative Amix uh, presents 
and I understand the concerns of the of the rural folks uh, wanting to keep their freedom. I think there's um, in any any case of being close to a municipality of any size that uh, there's there needs to be some sort of a, a accommodation for for a one or a five year plan for for the requests that are coming to folks uh, for provision of services. That I am not going to. Uh, argue that point. I think uh, you all have reviewed this for yourselves and you can uh, certainly uh, come up with a reasonable decision as far as bringing this to the House floor. So uh, if, um, okay, there's, yes, uh, Representative Essex. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to make a comment that um, sweeping legislation like this at the state level, we have such different circumstances on the east. The cities are growing so fast that three mile radius changes so quickly. Um, and on, on the west side, I understand they're infringing upon property rights. I know it's a, a difficult um, situation, um, but I, I just will add also local control is the key. I mean, with utilities and, and um, all the things that are provided and how quick um, Johnson County, for example, is growing, it makes it really hard to put a stop to that and say, oh wait, now we got more people. Now we got to start it again. So I, I just wanted to make comments about how one general uh, bill like this it, it affects people differently across the state based on size. Is there any other comments, Representative Miller? I I agree that local control trumps uh, state control in many cases, and this is one of them. And I don't know how many times uh, when I was canvassing when people would ask me. Uh, about different laws, uh, they wanted local control on how um, this type of thing was done. And so that's why I oppose it also. Thank you. And uh, we will um, give an opportunity. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just was going to add a comment too. I think, you know, based on the proponents that we heard there, are, it is too bad that they could not have better resolution at the local level with the things that are happening, but unfortunately the things happen and they are hurting the rural folks that are within these districts and these areas. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that those things can't be worked out more effectively. Um, one of the things we also heard from one of the opponents was when I asked the question was, would this affect any of the services they're getting? And they said it would not affect those. So I think that that's favorable too for the, the proponents that they would not be impacted by getting water or anything of that nature. So um, I think that this does offer some folks um, and I think due process is there for any kind of annexation in the future for, for cities and local governments. So they still have that control to be able to do that. Uh, there's no further comments. Uh, Representative Blex, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I close on House Bill 2150. Uh, all in favor of uh, passage as presented, say aye. All opposed? And uh, just for clarification, could I see a show of hands? No, I guess not. Uh, just, uh, for, 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 for affirmative, yeah. For aye. aye. For aye. Okay. I see four. Is that correct? Four to six, and the motion fails. All right. House Bill 2145 is, uh, and Jason, if you'd give a brief description on that. It seems somewhat related because it is somewhat related. Yes, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, House Bill 2145 um, is a similar bill uh, addressing this problem. Um, it would leave in the authority for cities to um, reg uh, regulate planning and zoning in that three mile area. Um, but if it did so, then any residents of that area would become eligible to vote in any city elections. Um, and would become qualified electors of the city um, uh, for that uh, because they lived in that area. Um, it also makes provisions for um, redistricting members of the city governing body to include that area um, and uh, to accomplish that. Uh, so that would go into effect on July 1st. Uh, is there a motion regarding this? 
Representative Black. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that when the House committee looks at House Bill 2145, they pass it out favorably for passage. Is there a second to that motion? Seconded by Representative Barth. And for discussion. Yes, Representative Amex. All right, do I have to look in here? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I've heard a lot about this over, you know, the course of the years that have been involved, as, as you have too, I am, I'm sure, Mr. Chairman. And and I appreciate all the comments that, um, um, you know, that I've heard about this. But I still think, um, you know, there's a lot of work, and, and maybe it was brought up by um, one of the other representatives that, you know, that we need to probably do a little bit better job, we in the cities, um, of, of being able to work with rural people and making life a little bit easier. But, um, you know, th this here, this here, um, I know probably makes a lot of sense to, you know, a lot of people because of, of, the, of the way it's written. But um, I, um, I'm still going to oppose it because I think that you need to live within the uh, city limits. So anyway. Representative Andrew. Um, Likewise, um, similar to what one of our conferees said, you know, taxation without representation is not fair and as is representation without taxation. So uh, voting on elections that in a municipality that you don't live in just isn't quite right. Comments, um, any, anyone else? Representative Vest. From what I understand, they're still voting for county commissioners, right? I mean, as far as representation, they have their, they're still getting representation from their county. Just wanted to add that. And, and, as, and as well, uh, the, the county commission makes final rulings on, on uh, zoning and uh, that has been in, uh, put in place by city stuff. So there's, there's a, there is a projection. Uh, if there's no other questions, uh, Representative Black, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I close on House Bill 2145. Okay. All in favor of passage uh, uh, favorably for uh, House Bill 2145, say aye. All opposed? Aye. Volume. The no's have it. I think if, uh, if you'd like, if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and get a, a, a vote count. All in favor, uh, four, and uh, opposed, six. Very good. And then that that motion fails as well. So these two bills are are completed out for the for the biennium. I just want to make a comment that uh, when we have bills come before us like this, and especially when two of them in a row are are they go down, that is not a failure. That is a success uh, because the process has happened. The hearings happened amongst the, the, the important players in the, in the matter. And uh, we have had a discussion in public on microphone on, on the internet to let people know exactly um, what's been considered. That can happen again. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Representative Amex. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just want to say I appreciate the work that you've done as chairman today and um, getting us through a number of issues that are extremely important to so many people, and um, I appreciate you giving both sides the opportunity, uh, especially myself, to be able to uh, speak on the item. Surely. Thank you. Uh, is there anything else? Uh, I, I want to let you know that uh, in the next hour and a half you'll uh, or so, you'll be getting uh, an agenda for next Monday. And that is whatever bills we can work on Monday, we will also have to disposition on Monday. So uh, if we have uh, have the hearings, uh, you'll see which ones will be heard. And we'll also uh, seek to get uh, a disposition of uh, up or down for those bills on Monday. So it'll be, a, it'll be a quick one. We have no more days except for Monday to work uh, before uh, we're done for this one. Please keep that in mind. Watch and see what's going on, and, and let people know to come come to the hearings and present testimony. Thank you so much, and this meeting is adjourned.